everyone, bit of a departure here from my usual A&P content videos, but I wanted to take a minute to share with you all a model that really frames all the decisions that I make as a teacher and all the decisions that I make as a learner whenever I'm trying to like study something or help somebody else learn a new concept. And by understanding this model that talks about the types of memory, as well as this forgetting curve that talks about, you know, the fact that we forget most of the stuff that we learned the first time, you can make better decisions for yourself as a learner. And so that upcoming test that you have, you're going to do better on it. Or if you're just learning a new skill, you're going to be able to master that skill quicker. And so this is something I think that can really benefit anybody, whether you're learning a &P or learning any other skill or topic in school. So I got my tea here and my cool mug. Let's uh, jump to the whiteboard and get started. This model we're looking at is called the information processing model. And in the model, there's three types of memory that we have. We have sensory memory, we have working memory, and we have long-term memory. And the goal of all of this is to get information from our sensory memory into our long-term memory where we can store it and then use it in the future whenever we need it, maybe on a test, maybe next time we're doing this particular skill that we're trying to learn, we wanna get those things into our long-term memory. Now I've got three different shapes for our boxes here and that's for a reason. Think of this like this, if you've got two axes here, I've got a capacity axis right there. So the taller one of these boxes is, the greater capacity for the amount of things you can have in that type of memory. So sensory memory has kind of an infinite capacity. Long-term memory has like an infinite capacity for the amount of stuff that can be in there at once. And working memory has a very limited capacity. And then on our horizontal axis, we've got duration. So things in our sensory memory don't last very long at all. Working memory, they're gonna last for a little while, but long-term memory, it kind of goes off the edge right here. Things can stay in our long-term memory for the rest of our lives, really. But not everything that goes into our long-term memory stays there, and we'll see that later in the video. So let's start with sensory input. At any given time, there's tons of sensory input coming in. There's visual input, there's auditory input, there might be things happening in the background wherever you're watching this video from. And so your brain is filtering out the vast majority of all that sensory input. Most of it is forgotten almost immediately. Most of the things that you hear, that you see, your brain's immediately forgetting that. And our brains have evolved to do that. Like We don't want too much information overloading our working memory all of the time, and so we're forgetting most of the stuff. So how do you get something from your sensory memory to your working memory? Well, that's by paying attention to it. So here's my favorite example of this. This happens to me all the time. I'm meeting somebody for the first time and I wanna make sure I say the right thing. And so I'm focused on me saying the right thing and I forget to pay attention to their name as they tell their name to me. And so they say their name, I focused on the wrong thing and I immediately have forgotten it. Now they said their name you know, that auditory information, those sound waves vibrated against my eardrums and that went to my brain, but I wasn't paying attention to it, so my brain filtered that out as not important. So that would be an example of something entering our sensory memory, but it's forgotten almost immediately. So let's say I'm at a new social gathering, uh, a book club, I'm at a book club, for example. I'm at this book club and I'm trying to remember everybody's name. And so somebody introduces themselves to me, let's say their name is Richard, but I didn't pay attention to it. Now, maybe I hear them say their name to somebody else later on, and this time I'm really paying attention to it, and I move their name from my sensory memory to my working memory. All right, that guy's name is Richard, and that guy's name is Richard. Now that's not gonna necessarily stay in my working memory or long-term memory. It's gotta go through some steps to do that. And in fact, if I don't rehearse that information, I'm gonna lose that information from my working memory. So I hear the guy say his name is Richard, I'm gonna be like, okay, that guy's name is Richard, 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 Richard. But I'm trying to learn a bunch of names, let's say. And so there's Richard, and there's Angela, and there's Desmond, and, and I'm trying to remember all these names, something. Richard, Angela, Desmond, Richard, Angela, Desmond. That process of kind of repeating it to myself that's called rehearsal. I'm trying to keep it in my working memory. Another really good example of trying to keep something in my working memory is whenever I hear a phone number and I'm trying to remember the phone number long enough to enter it into my phone, or maybe I get like a two-step verification code. I'm trying to remember those six digits long enough so I can enter them in on my computer. And I just say those digits over and over again, 25472 or, or whatever the thing is. And I say those over and over again. I'm rehearsing them and I'm keeping them in my working memory long enough so that I can then enter them somewhere. Now, notice I'm saying keeping those in my working memory. In both of those examples, that information is not gonna go into my long-term memory if I just rehearse it for a little bit. In fact, those numbers that have no meaning to me, once I've used them, they're kind of then gone. In fact, we can only keep about five to seven pieces of information in our working memory at any given time. This really limits us, and it's the reason why we gotta get as much as we can into our long-term memory so that we can pull out just the pieces that we need at any given time, because we can only be thinking about five to seven pieces of information 
at once. So the next step is how do we get information from our working memory into our long-term memory where we can actually use it in the future? And so we do that through the process of learning or encoding. Now, the big thing about encoding is that you're making connections between different things. So let's say that I'm trying to remember the name Richard. And you know, what? I, as I'm talking to him, I learned that he's got a lot of money and said, oh, Richard, Richard is rich. He's got a lot of money. And maybe he isn't really, but I've just tried to make some association that'll help me remember his name. And maybe Angela and Desmond, they're actually brother and sister. And so I just think about, oh yeah, Angela and Desmond, they're brother and sisters at the book club. And I'm gonna to try to make as many connections as I can about these people and their names and the better connections that I can make with other things I already know. And those could be silly connections, whatever it is, that's gonna help move that information from my working memory into my long-term memory. I have a bunch of encoding strategies that I use whenever I'm trying to learn a new topic for a class. I'll share some of those later on in the video, so make sure you stick around for that. The next point I wanna make is that our long-term memory is actually pretty leaky, and we're gonna forget things over time. So let's say that I learned something, I learned these names, I show up at the book club a month later, and oh my gosh, I cannot remember Richard's name again. Our long-term memory is, is leaky. We've got to do something to help solidify those things in our long-term memory to make better connections so that we can remember them for the long-term. And we do that through a process. First, we get it into our long-term memory through the process of encoding, and then we'll strengthen it and keep it there longer through the process of remembering or retrieval. So this process of retrieval is really taking information from our long-term memory and bringing it back into our working memory. Now, that can be hard to do, and whatever it is hard to do, that's actually a good thing. The harder we work to do this retrieval process, the better. So maybe I'll learn those names and then I wake up the next morning and I'm gonna be like, oh, let me see if I can remember all the people that I met at that book club. Now, that might be tough to do and I might just sit there and think about it and I might picture Richard in my head and I'm trying to remember him and I just, oh, what is his name? Is it Randy? Is it Ralph? And it's like, it's there and I'm really working at it. And, oh, oh. Richard, it's Richard. That process is actually gonna strengthen that memory. So the next time I try to remember Richard's name, I'm gonna remember it better because I went through that process of retrieval. In fact, if I just didn't struggle with it at all, if I just looked up his name online or something and I found his picture and his name, also that makes me sound like a stalker, don't do that. But if I did that, that would actually not build it in as strong. The fact that I had to struggle to try to remember it actually really helps. So whenever you're learning something, if you're struggling to remember it and then you remember it, that actually solidifies that better. And so so the more that we can do this retrieval practice, the more we're gonna build up that information in our long-term memory. So encoding is about making connections, making really strong connections with new information to what we already know. And then retrieval is what we do after we kind of learn it and understand it to build it up and really solidify it in our long-term memory so we don't forget it over time. And that's that process of trying to remember the things that we had learned and bringing them back into our working memory. The next graph I'm gonna show you is really gonna elucidate this whole forgetting over time with long-term memory and what we can do about it. So this is called the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve, and it's gonna have two axes on it. First, we have our memory axis right here. It's gonna go from 100 to 0%, and then we have our elapsed time, or the number of days that have passed since you learned that thing. So let's say you're learning some new information. You're studying the digestive system, let's say, and you're at 100%, meaning it doesn't mean that you've learned everything there is about that system, but you've learned 100% of whatever it is that you learned at the end of that session. Immediately, within the next day or so, you've probably forgotten about half of it, and after another day, you may be down to 30%. Don't pay too much attention to the exact numbers. This is just to give you kind of an idea of the trend that happens over time. Then after a week or so has passed, you're not really remembering much at all of what you studied. And you think, hey, maybe I'm just not good at learning. But you know what? This whole forgetting curve is totally normal. It happens with me. It happens with really almost everybody. And so it's totally normal. When you learn something once, you're going to forget it over time. So what do you do? How do you combat that? Well, you've got to review it again. You've got to do some retrieval practice with it. Now, the best time to do that is after a day has passed. After you've slept, sleeping plays kind of a big role in memory formation. So after you've slept, maybe the next day, you're going to review it. Now, when you review it, you don't want to just read over your notes. You want to review it using some sort of active retrieval, active recall, where you're trying to effortfully remember the information. And maybe you do read back over some notes, but then you're gonna to try to remember it, you try to explain it to somebody else, something like that. And when you review that, then this is gonna happen. You start to forget it again. But if you notice, let's say that you only reviewed it once, you're still gonna remember more than if you didn't review it again at all. So what do you do? Well, let's say after another day or two has passed, 
you're gonna review it a second time. And this time after reviewing it a second time, more of it's gonna stick with you. Maybe you're down to 60% or so if you don't study that stuff again. And let's say you review it a third time. And now after this maybe third time reviewing, after you've slept maybe a day or two later, now most of that information is really gonna stick with you long term. And so when you take that unit test or you take that semester exam or whatever it is, that information is gonna stick with you because you've reviewed it multiple times over multiple days. And this is such a powerful idea. It means that when we set up our study schedules, we don't wanna just cram the night before because we're gonna forget that after our test or, or you know when we need it on this, the final exam. And so we wanna spread out our review, especially if there's lots of information that we've got to learn. So that's the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. Let's go back to this model right here. And I talked a little bit about this process of encoding, the process of retrieval. And this is really where you can strengthen your learning and make sure that you learn really effectively and do really well in your classes and your exams and all that sort of thing. I've got a whole A&P survival guide where I've got 12 different strategies. 10 of those are gonna be about encoding and retrieval. And there's a few strategies about like planning out your sessions. So I wanna open that up real quick and show you a couple strategies from that that you can use. But if you want that guide, it's totally free. There'll be a link in the description as well as the end of this video. So here I've got the A&P survival guide pulled up on my computer. Let me scroll down to the table of contents and I've got this broken down into retrieval and encoding strategies. I wanna talk about a couple strategies that I use the most when it comes to encoding and retrieval. And so the first one I wanna talk about is synthesizing. So let me jump down to page 16 here. I really like this because it's what I use whenever I'm creating videos. I'm gonna take information from a lot of different places, let's say from a textbook or from another video that I'm watching or maybe from the internet. And I'm gonna take all these things and I'm gonna to try to like summarize in my own notes notes doc, all of this information that I've been learning. I'm gonna to try to organize it in a way that makes sense to me. Now, all these other formats, like a textbook or a video, they have some format to them, they have some structure, but I put it into my own structure as I'm taking notes that's not necessarily the same as the places where I'm getting that information. And by doing that, I'm making connections and thinking about what things go with what and kind of putting it in my own words. That's a really powerful way of encoding because I'm not just passively taking in information, I'm actively making connections with different pieces of information that I'm learning, as well as with stuff that I already know. So synthesizing is a really good one. I really like using 3D models, of course. Categorization and mnemonics is a powerful one. I use categorization to make connections between different information. And mnemonics I use whenever there's maybe not connection between information. So if I'm learning like the carpal bones, I use the mnemonics so long to pinky, here comes the thumb to remember those. Mnemonics is a powerful one to use. Also just learning prefix of suffixes and roots for anatomy. That can be really powerful. Like, you know, if I know these roots, then if I see osteoarthropathy, I can be like, oh, that's just like osteo means bone, arthro means joint. So this is the bones of the joint and it's a disease, a pathology of those bones of the joint. So learning those root words is another kind of really powerful encoding strategy. But like I said, encoding is all about making connections between different things. And so I've got other strategies in the guide here about how to make connections between things you're learning in anatomy and physiology. And this is all stuff that I'm doing when I'm first learning new information. Now to keep that information in my long-term memory, I need to use some retrieval practice. So I'm gonna go over a couple retrieval practice um, techniques. The first one, and probably my favorite one, is called Explain Out Loud. And here's a secret. If you ever wonder how a teacher professor knows so much information, one of the reasons that they know so much is because they constantly have to explain it to other people, to the students. I learned more about anatomy and physiology the first year that I taught it because I had to really think through things and explain it out loud to my students. And that's how I really learned those topics really deeply. And here's another secret. You don't have to actually explain it to another human, although to another human is probably the best way to do it. You can just do that in the quiet of your own room, explain it out loud or under your breath or maybe to a camera, let's say. That's a really good way to practice retrieval. Another thing that I like is to do quick sketches. And so here's a diagram for my wrist video that I spent a long time making. And here's a really quick one that I just sketched out on a piece of paper. That one that I sketched out really quick was actually really effective for my learning because it was really quick and it gave me instant feedback about how well I actually knew this stuff. And in fact, I made a few mistakes in this diagram about some articulation between the metacarpals and the carpals here. By doing that quick sketch, it was some retrieval practice and I got feedback when I looked up the actual diagram I was like, oh, I messed up on a couple things. And that helped all this information stick in my long-term memory better. I got one more I wanna talk about real quick, which is flashcards. The thing I like about flashcards is that they really force you to do retrieval. You can't just look over your notes when using flashcards. You have to practice 
remembering the different information. And so if you're learning anatomy and physiology specifically, these are my um, A&P flashcards that I sell on my online store, store.seabridgescience.com. I've taken all these different topics, um, anatomy and physiology, made a flashcard for them. And on the back, I have the answers. So they're printable, the actual things, a digital download, but you print it out and then you can have a set of flashcards here. I call them study cards because there's actually a lot of information on each study card. Maybe you watch the video, maybe you're studying for a final exam and then you can practice each of those things and then check out your answers on the back there. I never liked making flashcards as a student, but if I had like an actual good set of flashcards I could use for a topic, I think it would have been helpful. So those are some encoding and retrieval strategies that you can use to strengthen your learning and to get things to stick in your long-term memory so you can do better on your tests and exams. And don't forget to check out the link in the description for that free A&P survival guide. It'll add you to an email list so you'll get some more emails from me about some of the different strategies and stuff as well as other products and stuff that I sell. You can unsubscribe anytime, but the A&P survival guide is totally free because I want to help you learn and learn better and not use ineffective study strategies, which I also cover in the guide what not to do. Um, before I cover what to do. So yeah, thanks for letting me share about the information processing model and the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. I, I really um, kind of nerd out on this kind of stuff as a teacher and somebody who likes to learn and think about how we learn. Um, so yeah, best of luck in your studies. And I guess I'll see you in the next video. All right, bye-bye.